fathers, and I'm really just talking to us today from a portion of scripture, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And we want to look at fathers, both in terms of God our Father and we as fathers. So we're looking at fathers. First, um, Ephesians 3 verses 14 and 15 reads, and you may follow, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named. This is the word of the Lord. And so, Lord, as we open your word this morning to focus on fathers, we pray that you will give us a word today as fathers, as fathers to be as males in general, a word, Lord, that we can use to make us more like you, our Father, so that our lives as fathers will honor and glorify you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's just have a little talk. Ultimately, the ultimate reality is not cold. Ultimate reality is not dark. Ultimate reality is not an empty space. Ultimate reality, my brothers and sisters, is the Father reaching out and gathering sinners as his own dear children through the grace of his son, Jesus Christ. Ultimate reality is that graciously, our heavenly father shares the wonder of his fatherhood with us men. Can I say to us men, therefore then, that to be a father is a sacred privilege and a very high calling. Can I tell us men that? Can you remind yourself of that? That being a father is a sacred privilege and that it is a very high calling? Unique to the Bible is the vision of the one God as the Trinity. God, the rejoicing Father. God, the obedient Son. And God, the loving Spirit as the presence between the Father and the Son. It is no wonder amazing and, and not surprising then that such a God would create us men as fathers on earth to, some, to embody something of his glorious fatherhood. I want to talk to us a little bit about the Father, God the Father, and what the Bible has to say about God the Father. The Old Testament, it would be good if you have pen and paper so you can write down, because there's a lot of scriptures that I'm going to quote. You may want to read them afterwards at your own time and leisure, men especially. You may want to note these scriptures and read them afterwards. The Old Testament says surprisingly little 
But though the Old Testament clearly calls God Father a few times, for example, in Isaiah 63, verse 16, in Isaiah 64, verse 8, in Jeremiah 3, verse 19, and in Malachi 2, verse 10. Those are the times when the Old Testament called God Father. The writers of the Old Testament lay great emphasis on our distance from God and the reserve we should feel before him. God is revealed as separate from us and beyond us. And he's seen less intimate and close to us in the Old Testament. The Old Testament view of God is true and wonderfully humbling for us. We hasten to bow, to bow low before our powerful creator and high king. But can I say to us that in the New Testament, although God remains holy and majestic in our eyes, Jesus adds a strikingly clear emphasis on God as father. Both his father, that is Jesus, and our father, John gospel 20 and verse 17. In Mark 14 and verse 36, it is Jesus who calls God Abba, Father. It is Jesus who teaches us to pray to God as our father in Matthew 6 and verse 8, verse 9, sorry. It is the spirit of the son who leads us into intimacy with God as our own Abba Father, according to Galatians 4 and verse 6. Now we know that as our Father, God cares for us and provides for us, according to Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Also, as our father, fathers, brothers and sisters, we hear and answer, he hears and answer our prayers. And we find that in Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. As our father, he disciplines us. Hebrews 12, 3 to 11. As our father, he receives us and forgives us and rejoices over us when in repentance we come home to him. Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. That God the Father has made himself God, our Father, means that he is personally, emotionally, and even sacrificially involved with us. Can I say to us this morning that the greatest glory of God, therefore, is not that he is separate and far beyond us. That the greatest glory of God is that the one who is separate and far beyond us, who is high and lifted up, the one who created all things and need nothing from any human being, that that glorious God also chose to become our father, lovingly adopting us as his own children forever. First John 3 and verse 1, and the whole house should have been saying, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. It is an awesome thing. God never had to do it, you know. So high and lifted up. He never had to take us on as his children. But he chose to do it. I don't know about you, but I am elated that God has given me an opportunity to be reconciled back to him as his child and he as my father. I bless his name for that. You know, one of the wonderful privilege that we have with God is that even though he is a king, 
that even though he is the creator, the Lord of lords, the high and lifted of God, that I can wake up any hours of the morning and call to him and he's going to answer me. He's going to listen to me. He's not going to turn me away and tell me that I'm disturbing his sleep. What an awesome God. What an awesome God. It doesn't matter the time of day. You and I have access to God our Father. God our Father is never ever too busy for us. Thank you God. For being our Father. I also like the fact that I can go to God, my father, even when I mess up. Yes. And he's going to listen to me. I can confess to him. And he's going to hear me. And he's going to forgive me. He's not going to run me away. And he's not going to take up no big stick to batter me. But he's going to hear me. Because he cares. Our heavenly father is concerned and care about us. And this is the message that the New Testament teaches us about God, our Father. What does the Bible therefore then say about we, men, as Father? Remember, there's only two things I'm talking about. I'm talking about God, our Father, and then I'm talking about men as Father. From, and I'm looking at it from the biblical perspective. The New Testament, or the Bible as a matter of fact, says many significant things about men as father. Some good and some bad. The Bible says that fatherhood shapes personal identity and self-awareness for good and bad. Fatherhood can pass down a rich spiritual inheritance binding our hearts to God. According to Exodus 15 and verse 2, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 7, Psalm 44 and verse 1, and Psalm 78, verses 1 to 4. The Bible also says, fatherhood can also pass down a history of failure that we must not deny. Nehemiah 1, verse 6, and 9, verse 2. Fatherhood is also how training, nurture, and wise correction influence the rising generation. Proverbs 3, 11 to 12, and Proverbs 4, 1 and 4. And I pause here because this is one of the greatest challenges that we're having in our society today. The lack of fatherhood in the homes. It is why the training, the nurture, and the wise corrective influence is not being seen in so many of our young men. The society is in shock and awe because of crime and violence, which is primarily, and I said primarily, being led by our male 
Now, there are a few females that are also involved in crime and violence. But the reality of the situation is that the lack of fatherly influence in the home contributes a lot to what it is that we are experiencing in our society today. And so the Bible places the responsibility upon us as fathers. I'm talking to fathers, grandfathers, and fathers to be. Oh yes, great grandfathers too. As long as you're alive, you will still have an influence to bear upon the lives of the upcoming generation. Do not shirk your responsibility. Say your peace. Say your peace. Sometimes the parents, those of us, those of us who have become grandparents, <laughs> sometimes the parents might be vexed and upset with you, but say your peace. Because God expect you to do so. In fact, when you look in the Bible, 1 Samuel 3, 11 to 13, you see where God punish fathers for not restraining their foolish sons. Eli. So there is a punishment for the fathers. If you don't do the right thing. Because sometimes we fall into the trap of Eli. Where we are honoring our sons above God. We treat them like little princes. First Samuel 2, 27 to 30. And if we fall into that trap, if we are already into that trap, there is time for you to come out. And if you're not falling out yet, nobody falling out. Because there is a punishment awaiting you from God. Right throughout the Bible, you're going to find that the Bible records the weaknesses of fathers. For example, in Genesis 19, verses 15 and 16, and further down in the same chapter, verses 30 to 38, you see an example of Lot and how Lot harmed his family by his half-hearted concern about the degrading influence of Sodom. The weakness. Jacob is another one. He unwisely, listen fathers, especially young fathers, he unwisely showed favoritism to his son Joseph over his other sons. Read it in Genesis 37 verses 3 and 4. And we know what that caused. We know the agony and the trauma that he put Joseph through. Because his father treated him as favorite and never hide it, him show it. And brought on the wrath of the other children upon Joseph. Listen and learn on this Father's Day. Samson's father weakly gave in to his son's wrong desire for a woman from outside the covenant community. Judges 14, 1 to 3. The man after God's own heart, David, bungled a crisis in his family by failing to discern a threat to his daughter Tamar and by failing to discipline his sons Amnon and Absalom. And we know what Absalom did. The misery that Absalom caused him. In fact, he had to run. Take with himself. My grandmother used to tell me, say, she not spoil no pitney. 
Because she now make them bite off her ears. Don't know if you know the term. <laughs> but when you spoil the child, you're going to be embarrassed in more ways than one. And some, some parents, see sometimes you go to the supermarket and you see some children. When parents refuse to buy them what they want, you see the disgrace. But that's because you spoil them. That is because they are spoiled. Thank God none of my children ever try that with me. And I hope they won't let their child or children try that with them. Yes, we have a responsibility as men, as men to stand up and take our rightful places in our homes, in the schools, in the workplaces, and in our societies, not to mention in our church. Men need to stand up and take their rightful places. It is true that a wise father in disciplining his children is careful not to be so impossible to please that he drives them up the wall. So, so Ephesians 6 and verse 4 is teaching us that while as father we should discipline and while we should take our rightful places in society, we must not abuse our disciplining. You know, so that parents do that. Yeah, man. And some of us may be guilty. That's how we know I said that. <laughs> but sometimes we overdo the disciplining. Yes. And you see when we overdo the disciplining, it do more harm than good. You know? Yes. And sometimes I tell you, not that I'm agreeing with this now, but sometimes I see some, some, some older folks abandoning life and they have children. But their children abandon them because of how they treated their children. No, I'm not encouraging that because I think that is wrong. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. Irrespective of how your parents treat you, you must honor them. That's what the Bible teaches. Because they are your parents. But let us learn from the word of God that while we discipline, we must not over discipline. A godly father is rightly graced with dignity and honor and he can expect long-term impact. Psalm 127 verses 3 to 5. To lead a family happily united in the Lord is a beautiful experience for a father, says Psalm 128. Now hear this. A faithful father is not lazy mm -hmm, or heedless but conscientiously takes responsibility for his children, one, spiritual welfare. Job 1, 4 to 5. Train up a child, um, Proverbs tells us in the way that he should go, that even when he gets old, though he may stray, he will not depart. That you know them go, after a while when them get big, you know, the early stage of them getting big, them like to do them own things. But as they get older, they will come back to that training that they got in the earlier years. So train them in the right way. Pray for them. When you see them start to do them own things, yes? And seem like them ignore the training. Pray for them. Don't isolate them and don't abandon them. Pray for them. And leave them to God. He will bring them back in his own time and his own space. 
a faithful father, boldly claim his family for the Lord. Joshua 24, 14 and 15. Leads his family through life with unmistakable spiritual commitment. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. Brings his family before the Lord in prayer. John 4, 4 to 6, 53. All when your children don't know, you must still pray for them. All when them out of your sight, you must still pray for them. And all when you are praying and you don't see no turning, still pray for them. In fact, pray for them more. Pray for them more. Keep on bringing them before the Lord. Yes, that's what spiritual fathers do. We pray for our children and we keep them before the Lord. A faithful and spiritual father provides for his family with good, notice, good earthly things according to their legitimate needs. So when I spoil them, we take care of them according to their needs, not their wants. That's why so many little children get so much problem, you know. And look, reality, you know, reality check. You and I as fathers, we may bust our shot to make sure that our children get the best there is. But we have to prepare them, you know, for the eventualities of life. Because if we don't do that, when the eventuality hit them, they are not going to know how to handle it. And they may end up doing the wrong things. So we're not providing for no wants. We are providing for needs. Make sure them have food to eat, clothes to wear, roof over their head, that kind of a thing we are provide for. We now run up and down and bust with neck for them, get everything with them for them friend out of the road with. That are no need. And so we have to understand our role as fathers and understand how to look after our children. So we, we, we treat them, we give them according to their legitimate need. We respond to their requests with God gifts. Luke 11, 11 through 13. And we look into the future and plan ahead for them. I don't know if you know, but I know in one of these countries that I grew up in, that some, well, life story, real thing. I know a farmer who refused to send his children to any school other than just Elliot school. Because his thing is, he now make them come out better than him. Real thing. Him a farmer, and them must become farmer. It is sad. And I hope none of our fathers to be, or our young fathers, will ever take this perspective concerning their children. In fact, I really think that every parent, notice I'm not saying father now, I really think that every parent ought to ensure that their child or children come out better than them. I really think that's a responsibility that we have. Not because you never go university means that you now make them go university. And if all you could afford is a first degree, push them to a second degree. Let them come out better than you. Let them come out in, 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 in life doing much better than you and looking much better than you. This is our God-given responsibility. Can I encourage our fathers today that as you reflect, on the day. And as you look back over time on your contribution, 
that where you see that you have done wrongly, may you seek to correct. And where you have been doing good, may you do even better. May you encourage your children to walk good in life, to respect and honor God, to respect and honor everybody around them. Because part of the problem in society is that society has lost respect. You and I see that every day. When I was a child growing up, I could not dare pass anybody on the road and don't say, oh, it to them. No, you don't see that. In fact, the generation nowadays is quicker to tell you some colorful words, but I tell you good morning. We have a responsibility to train our children differently and to encourage them. Not only should we train them differently, but we should encourage them to be different. Because the truth is, Sometimes we train them, but when they go out the road, they allow them friends to influence them. We must teach them to be the influencer in society. Yes? We must teach them and encourage them to become leaders, not followers. Because oftentimes, who they are following is leading them down the wrong path. And that is why our society is where it is today. We want to give God thanks for fathers because the truth is, if there were no fathers, there would be no mothers and there would be no children. And if we have no fathers, no mothers, and no children, then we have a stagnant society. So let us encourage our fathers. As the ladies did today, let us continue to encourage them throughout the year. Not just hold it back until Father's Day, although it's highly appreciated. But give that encouragement as often as you can. Because yes, we're going like we have a whole heap of ego and we may not show it, but we need the encouragement. So help us. Happy Father's Day to all fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, and fathers-to-be. May the Lord bless us in Jesus' name.